Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast. In this presentation, I want to talk to you about some ideas I've been thinking about on how to kind of reconceptualize our understanding of how athletes use contextual information um, to perform sports skills. And I'm going to mostly uh, focus on fast uh, ball sports like baseball and tennis. So what am I talking about here? With the two terms that you often see kind of associated with this are situational probabilities or contextual priors. And the idea is that in sports, there's certain events, for example, a pitcher throwing a fastball or your opponent serving cross court, the probability of those events varies based on some other factors. Some, uh, uh, for example, the count in baseball, the number of balls and strikes, the score in certain sports, uh, the positioning of your opponent, like in tennis, a person is more likely to serve cross court depending on where they're standing in the in the service box, right? So there's an idea here that there's contextual information that you can use to anticipate what's going to happen. These can be both generic, like in baseball, bat, uh, pitchers tend to throw fastballs when they get behind in the count, like a, three balls and no strikes. Or they can be very specific to a certain athlete. And, you know, um, they could have, uh, certain athletes could throw certain pitch types in count, different counts. We assume that we need these because the, once the action starts and information is available from the unfolding action, the ball is released or the ball is served, the time is so short, right? We need to get a head start. We need to get a head start in some way. And the last thing I wanted to mention is I, I want to treat the con these contextual information a little bit differently than a tendency, what I would call. So a tendency, for example, Clayton Kershaw's pitching data, a tendency is a you know a person tends to go left. That's not attached necessarily attached to the context of the, the situation. So there's a lot of research showing that athletes do seem to use these sources of information when performing. On the left is some st a study that I did a long time ago looking at baseball batting, and I basically found that when you throw a fastball to the pit a batter in a count in which there's a higher probability of fastballs, the pitcher's behind in the count, two balls and no strikes, they tend to do better. They have lower errors. <clears throat> and on the right is a more recent study by Loffing and Hageman where they looked at uh, uh, temporal occlusion tasks, so uh, athletes anticipating serve direction. And what they found was experienced tennis players, uh, the skilled tennis players, tended to anticipate cross-court serves more, more often depending on the position of the server. Right? So these kind of contextual dependencies. So athletes seem to be using that. But what I want to really get into, and really the crux of the issue for me and what's made me kind of change my thinking over the, you know, more recently is, what exactly are the athletes doing with this information? Knowing that a pitch is going to be a fast or knowing that a serve is going to be cross court because of the context, what do you do with that? Okay, and I think that this raises some real issues in our understanding. The first possibility I, I you know a lot of people talk about is maybe we use this information to make a gross kind of crude initial movement. So I'll start leaning left in tennis if you're going to hit cross court. I'll start shifting my weight early what sometimes we call sitting on a fastball in baseball. And this kind of gets perpetuated sometimes by the, the responses we use in anticipation research, right? We have persons step left and step right uh, in anticipation of the serve direction. That's how we actually measure their ability. But when we look at this kind of in more active, realistic tasks, we find that it doesn't seem to really hold up, right? There's not really much evidence to support it. This is a really nice study by Triolet and colleagues when they looked, they tried to measure anticipatory stepping for sir in serves in tennis, and they found it's extremely rare. It doesn't occur very often, six to 13% of the events they measure. So it's not something that they're doing a lot. In baseball, um, in some of the work that I've done recently looking at force plate data and batter shifting weight, Yes, you find that batters shift differently when there's a higher probability of fastball or versus a, a slower pitch like a changeup, but there's a lot more going on to it than that. To it than that, they're not just shifting early, making this gross movement of sitting on a fastball. There, you can see in there, there's actually kind of a coupling, a functional variability between the different stages of the swing that's taking in information all, all the whole time. Right? It's not some just crude getting ready uh, response. So it doesn't seem to fit that explanation. The other one, of course, that's even more common is the idea that this contextual information, knowing it's a fastball or knowing it's cross court, is feeding into an internal model I'm going to use to predict 
the actual trajectory of the ball to program in some way a movement, use it to plan my movement. And so this is sometimes called predictive control. And the idea, of course, is um, in, in, uh, built into a lot of these models is that I'm going to use this contextual information. I'm going to add to it information I get later on that's even more reliable. So I'm going to add to it kinematic information from the server, the body language. I'm going to add to it information from the ball flight into my internal model to make a prediction and somehow program an action. Um, in this, of course, we have to make you know emphasize that this contextual information, right, is what Gibson would call non-specifying. Right, it's not enough, right, to to be able to perform an action, knowing that a ball is fast or a serve is cross court is not enough, right? It doesn't tell me its exact location, its exact time of arrival. So I'm going to need to do some work to get that, and that's where this internal predictive model comes in. Right, so here's a couple versions of this. Um, I've been trying to actually, actually put this into a model where they actually how the action is controlled. Something that's not done very often <laughs> in the anticipation research and a lot of research. So the I, one version is we could take the contextual information, predict it's a fastball, and kind of feed that into a full blown world model. So a kind of a physics model where I'm predicting projectile motion. Another alternative I kind of outlined, and this is a paper I have coming out soon, is I could have a store of memories of trajectories. So for this pitcher, this opponent, a fastball tends to follow this trajectory, almost kind of like a lookup table. So once I know it's a fastball, I can look it up and, and perform program my action. There's also, I should um, very kind of more recently, very elaborate models of how we combine these different information sources and, and make this prediction in this internal model. And a very common approach is to use kind of a Bayesian approach where we weight the different information sources based on their reliability. And that's an example right there. But what I wanna point out is I have some problems with this predictive control description of how this contextual information and advance cues and other source of information are being used. I think there's some major problems with it. On the surface, it sounds intuitively really nice story, but there's some problems for me. First of all, I don't see how this model can be co complex enough to account for the dexterity, um, Bernstein's idea of adaptability, problem solving of an athlete. And a good example I like to use, this is a quote from Rafael Nadal. Uh, the key point to take out of this quote is no shot is ever the same, right? He's making every shot is different. Um, so in order to have kind of a probability in, in Bayesian thing, we'd have to have a store of thousands and thousands of possible outcomes. Or in my lookup table, thousands and thousands of possible trajectories, right? It's not like there's just a handful of events we're preparing for. We're preparing for an infinite possible combination of events. So that's one problem. The other problem I really have with a lot of these models and this predictive control idea is that it really just displaces the problem. It doesn't solve it, right? It's taking the problem of how I get my bat to the ball in the right time from the environment and sticking it in my head. Right. And the way that I like to illustrate this is most models of anticipation. This is Gary Klein's model. I like to use this figure to show this. They have a ton of information about the processing and the perception side of things, like the Bayesian model and all that. And then at the bottom, they have implement course of action or move or swing. Right. There's not enough. They're not describing how the information is actually used. Who looks at that prediction we create? How is it actually used? Is it used to program a ballistic movement? The data doesn't seem to be consistent with that. Then what is it being used for? Um, and another problem is it's inherently circular, right? The uh, idea that I can't perceive the world unless I have prior knowledge of Bayes uh, priors, where do I get those Bayes priors in the first place, right? It's inherently circular view. So the alternative, of course, to uh, this prediction idea of predictive control is online perspective control, where I couple my movement to the information. I'm not going to go get into a lot of detail of this, but this is, again, in this paper I have coming up. But for me, the real strength of this is I'm actually specifying what's going on with the movement and how it relates to the information. And here you're controlling the acceleration forward movement of your the bat and your body based on the information, right? There's laws there, there's predictive rules there that I can use, right? I'm not just saying move. Here's a prediction, use it to move, right, in another box, okay? Um, 
And but of course, that, that's all fine and good, Rob. You're using information online, but where does this context fit in? Well, for me, I think I, you know, Bill Warren has a great quote of this. I don't think, as he's pointing out here, I don't think we have to pull it into our head and and make it priors and process it. I think we can understand it better in terms of the ideas of direct learning from Jacobs and Michaels. In particular, I think we can talk about what is going on with contextual information instead of using it to generate a prediction about the actual trajectory of the ball. I think I would propose that what it's being used for by athletes is to select an action they intend to execute, right? The, the context tells us what the situation affords us, the score, the opponent's position, right? So I think what's going on is they're using it to select appropriate action, not use it for this predictive control, right? And I've seen, I have more of this coming soon, but I've seen um, if you uh, change the context, it looks very similar in, in my results in, in baseball is if you change the task, right? You give a task to the batter of hitting to the opposite field, looks very similar to changing the context. The other thing, other side of this I'll point out is um, we can explain a lot of this too, I think with calibration. So within that control model, I, I showed quickly, um, there's a calibration concept constant. We adjust it based on the kind of the environment. Are we hitting lots of fast pitches? Are we hitting lots of slow pitches? We can use this to adjust to to the situation and then an opponent's tendencies. So and for me, these education of intention ideas and uh, calibration ideas are a much more direct, straightforward way to account for these effects of context rather than appealing to some complex model of Bayesian model or whatever model in which we don't even actually have a motor control part of it, right? So for me, this is, uh, I see this as a better route. And the final example I will give you, right, is if that I think points to this, if, if we really believe that this was, context was used to generate this model, then why do people have struggle when they first face an opponent, right? But in baseball, there's this effect called the third time through the order penalty. This is an example shown from a pitcher that's been around for years. Batters do worse the first time they face him every game than the third time they face him. If I had all this information stored, all this knowledge, all these priors, why in the world would I have trouble the first time I see him? He's been pitching for 13 years, right? Haven't I learned his tendencies? That this effect, though, could be easily explained by calibration, right? So for me, I think... In order to move this field forward, anticipation field forward, we need to take the motor control part more seriously. How am I actually using that information to move? And for me, using this kind of direct learning approach is a much more parsimonious way to do that than, than the, you know, the Bayes models and other internal mo uh, predictive models. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to find out more about the podcast, you can, of course, go here. Um, and cheers for now.